Hey. Today we intended to talk about stoic parenting, which I found um, I found interesting. Um, I found interesting that Shakam had uh, recommended that, and not um, Tony or, or somebody else who was who was an actual parent. Um, I'm not sure if we have any other parents in the group uh, who are present right now. Uh, Tony, I know obviously is uh, Tobias. Okay, uh, Toby is also a parent, and Giannis. Okay, so fantastic. Um, you guys will probably have a little bit more to say, perhaps. Uh, than, than the rest of us um, in terms of at least experience um, uh, for, for us who are still waiting or un unexpectedly going to have kids in the near or far future. I did want to start out with a, with a slideshow. Um, so I, I have a quote I wanted to uh, share with everybody and just uh, the few light frog and the few prompts for main questions that Toby and I had um, put on Telegram that we can kind of go through and, and discuss in terms of parenting and stoicism and the intersection. Um, so let me share my screen with you guys. I'm only gonna share um, the specific window for my presentation, so it won't be full screen, um, but hopefully you guys can see it just fine. Um, so actually, the quote I wanted to share with you guys is by Tony. Uh, Tony, I thought had a, um, I hope you don't mind, Tony, I, I took one of your quotes from Telegram and uh, it was this long response to Toby and I thought it was a really nice quote, something that um, uh, really encapsulated, I guess, how a parent would feel um, incorporating stoicism into their lives um, and in their, in their in educating their children. He says, with my six-year-old, I try to apply stoic principles to real-life situations whenever possible. Uh, he said the other day he was upset because one of his classmates said his painting was rubbish. It was an ideal opportunity to discuss the dichotomy of control in very simple terms. The logic really made sense to him, and he's no longer bothered by the boy or his opinion. On a family level, we discuss stoicism quite often as both myself and my wife work from, work from home. Excuse me, that was a typo. Uh, sounds corny, but we usually discuss a quote by one of the big three at the breakfast table. It helps us to start the day on the right footing. Asking each other's opinions on the quote and how its message could relate to our own circumstances is useful. For us, it's about making stoicism part of the natural backdrop to our lives. It's just always there. When situations arise that require some deliberation, then it naturally becomes part of the discussion. Uh, Tony, that was really that was really like a really nice quote, a really nice uh, um, statement that you made um, because it, it has a few different things in it, a few different exercises that you you use to help your kid understand um, real life situations. Um, I'm just curious, actually, I guess to start us off on a on the discussion, Tony, from uh, when you do do this with your family, with your son, do you mention stoicism specifically? Like, do you do you to your son? Do you talk about the philosophy of stoicism, or do you kind of just bypass that and do you go right into, um, or like, for example, do you, do you label stoicism? Do you label the dichotomy of control? Or do you just simply discuss with him, is this within your control or not? Yeah, I just discuss whether it's in, in his control or not really. <clears throat> um, but what I like to do then afterwards, maybe a couple of hours later, I'll just say, hey, have you ever heard of a guy called Marcus Aurelius? Or something like and it, it just starts a, a, a different type of discussion then so he knows what stoicism is he knows that that I, i'm on now he knows that I, I, i'm on a stoic forum and things of that nature he doesn't understand what stoicism is to the level where i could discuss the technicalities of the dichotomy of control so really it's just keeping it in really simple terms you know he's really upset with that kid and in his world it's a major deal um so it's applying what we know through stoicism to his situation in, in that very moment. And logic works, logic and reason always works. Um, but the technicalities and the sort of, you know, the, the academic side of it, I don't discuss with him. I have a 20 year old son as well. And I do discuss the technicalities and the sort of academic side with him. And stoicism really helped him over the last, particularly over the last six months. Um, so yeah, it's horses for courses. You know, for a six-year-old, you have to put it into six-year-olds, in, into a six-year-old world. We're reading about Marcus Aurelius, the historical side of things, which he finds really, really interesting. So there's about three or four different directions you can approach things in, as long as it just stays really relevant to his world. 
and not just to my world. That's the important thing. It's a, yeah, thank you. It's a, um, uh, really nice how you characterize that also as a, as a teacher, I can definitely understand that when you're, when you're teaching somebody younger, like if I'm teaching a, a middle school student who's maybe between the ages of um, nine and 13 or 14 versus somebody who is gra almost graduating, you know, I, as somebody who's between nine and 13 years of age, I wouldn't discuss with them the technicalities, uh, technicalities of the atom, but I'll discuss with them um, kind of the, perhaps the the general understanding of 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 charges of attraction and I'll show interesting demonstrations about what cool things could attract or repel each other and why and then once it gets once they get older then I can start talking about models of atoms and the protons and the neutrons so I think there's a it's a nice how you framed it where um, it's also nice to understand that you know when even when kids are young they can still understand these basic principles from very intuitive level um, uh, Philip your hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to ask Tony, um, do you see um, an, um, an immediate benefit? So as I like, you know, in the situation, your, your, your kid is upset and um, talking and thinking about what upset your kid uh, in those terms is helping uh, him. It's, it's, I don't know if it's a boy or a girl, but is it helping your child to, to um, see it in the, yeah, to calm down in the moment? Do you also see, um, long-term uh, change in, in outlook and um, an attitude towards um, challenges and difficult situations? Yeah, good question. Um, like my wife, he's a very intelligent person. Um, so it's easy to discuss things in logical and reasonable terms with him. So it was just a, with him personally, it's just a process that you go through. Um, if X equals Y, then therefore, you know, that type of conversation. So it's, it is rather instantaneous. With, with Charlie, I just see the penny drop. He's like, wow, yeah, I don't need to worry about this kid anymore. Who cares whether he likes my painting or not? You know, and it, it really is quite instantaneous. I think what's important for me as a parent is that I never had access to this knowledge when I was a kid. In fact, up until last year, I didn't know anything about stoicism. So what I want both of my kids to have is the knowledge and the tools to deal with life's difficulties um, in a practical way from a very, very young age. So I think with my youngest one in particular, that's a, a gradual process. It's going to take time. Um, but, you know, with my older, older lad now, he's just, his mind is blown by stoicism. And, you know, he's posting all types of stuff himself now on social media and everything else. Um, but yet the effect with the younger guy, um, he, he notices straight away what the logic is, processes it, and then applies it. I mean, kids are just so clever. I mean, they're 10 steps ahead of us. Um, so, yeah, it, it is quite instantaneous, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Chetan and then Toby. Oh, uh, I, I guess, your hand I guess yeah, yeah, I guess my, my hand was raised accidentally. I didn't mean to raise the hand. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and then Toby. Hello, is my mic working? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, Tony, I, I um, just wanted to ask how you really practically communicate this then with the six-year-old. So, so you say, so see, this is the things you can do, and this is just the other perspective of the boy. I, I was just interesting how you really practically communicate the stories and values, maybe. Sure. So I, I think with my boy, um, I want it to be in the sort of atmosphere of my home that he knows his dad is a stoic. He knows his mum is a stoic. He doesn't understand what stoicism is, but it's just there. Um, and I think that's all he needs to know about the technicalities of it. Really, for someone of his age, it's waiting for opportunities to arise which merit a stoic discussion. Um, so, for instance, that boy was an ideal opportunity to just discuss the dichotomy of control. It's not necessarily in sitting down and informing him about what stoicism is, about the big three or whatever. Although from a historical perspective, particularly Marcus Aurelius, 
is is very interesting to a six year old. Um, so it's waiting for opportunities and as a parent, you know, being wise enough to recognize the opportunity and to capitalize on it the best way that you can, but always staying in your child's world, never stepping outside that because otherwise it's relatively useless. Yeah. Mm, that makes that makes a lot of sense. I think um, you don't want to make it too abstract or pull from esoteric texts. Um, that um, and I mean, sure, the big three are not esoteric to us. I mean, we've read Seneca, Epictetus, and especially Marcus Aurelius, and I think um, we don't find them esoteric. But to a child, they may be a lot more abstract than we think. And um, I'm just thinking in, uh, for another example, like the virtues, for example, wisdom, temperance, justice, and um, courage. They are not really. I mean, e even then, they're not too esoteric. I mean, just l l naming them. They don't sound like they're anything abstract, but uh, the way in which they're always listed, like the way I listed them, can seem abstract. But I like the way you you just you 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 made some sort of statement, and I, I can't quote you on this, but you used the word wise, like to do this wisely or to make that wise decision. I think using those adjectives in your language with with your kids can also help. I don't know if any of you have seen this, but. Um, uh, framing it like that, you know, asking your kid, what do you think is the wise decision to do? Or what do you think, um, uh, if, if you need to tell the teacher something, what do you think the courageous thing would do, would, would, would be to do? So not talking about the virtue in an abstract definition, but using these adjectives to talk about decision making and actions might, might be preferable and might be more relatable for kids. I don't know what, what, what you would think, Tony, or, or anybody else. Something I noticed in your language also, I'm not sure if there's anything in the quote um, about uh, when you use uh, wise or any other adjective, no, but um, hmm. I think I'm gonna switch to the next and leave this on here. Um, I wanted to leave a couple of light frog in that Toby and I had posted. Um, these, are, these are the ones on the right the ones that we, I think three that um, uh, might be might be useful to center our discussion around um, beyond this point. Um, but I also put I also put uh, some general, more general light frog and prompts on the left hand side. And the reason is is that there's kind of two sides of the coin when it comes to parenting and stoicism. So up until now, and and we can continue, but up until now we've been basically been discussing this. Um, uh, this part how can we teach kids stoic values how can we incorporate stoic education when we when we raise our kids and how can they use them to you know become more characterful more self-sufficient and make more wise decision making um but another side of the coin that we shouldn't lose in our discussion is how can stoicism to make parents less anxious or themselves i i can i can completely just assume that um, anybody who's a parent is under a lot of stress and that stoicism doesn't just help their kids, it can help themselves. Um, uh, something that um, if anybody had looked at any of the links I posted um, on the meet on the meetup events, um, Meredith Kuntz, her name comes up a lot. She does a stoic, the Stoic Mom blog, and she has also written an article or two on, on modern stoicism. She did the podcast interview I posted on, on the Stoic Psychologist. She's kind of like the, the lead, um, uh, speaker on the intersection between parenting and stoicism right now. Um, and she talks about that a lot. She talks about how also stoicism can help parents less stress, be less stressful, less anxious. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, what do you, I guess, I guess an open question, I guess to anybody, but also to parents as well. I mean, is there a specific, um, is there anything specific about parenting that you find the most anxious or most stressful that you've found that stoicism has helped with the most? In help in helping you deal with that. I think for me personally, it's um, yeah, it's it's about a sense of duty that you have. So, 
it might sound stupid, but at the end of the day, I'm at the end of a working day. I can be quite physically destroyed. You know, just feel absolutely done in. And then my boy will say, Dad, come on, let's play tag. And that's my idea of hell, logically. But because of my sense of duty, and because I know it's the right thing to do anyway, I'll, I'll play tag, I'll, I'll go that extra yard. And you always have to do that with your kids anyway. And I think stoicism is all about that. It's doing things which may be not the most natural thing to do at the time. Um, but you do it because of a sense of duty, but also you understand the benefits of it also. Um, so there's many opportunities in parenting where that's the case. But I just find it when I'm tired and when I would usually just think I just want to sleep, um, I take on those stoic principles and just do what I need to do as a sense of duty. Uh, I think I think Philip's gone to the door. I saw his hand raised, but I think that's just because he he switched his mic off. Um, but no, thank you. Um, that's that's also like as a I'm just trying to make some intersections here. Parenting and, and teaching, I feel like, are, are similar in some ways, and I also feel the same way. My my students just finished about two and a half weeks worth of exams. They didn't have exams every day, but they had maybe two exams every week. And uh, they always space them out depending on the subject level and how many exams the school has to schedule in any case. Um, and um, that was exactly the kind of marathon. I felt like a marathon. Every, every, every teacher feels this, the, the two or three weeks worth of exams they have to go through for their students in the school. It's like a marathon. It's not just preparing the exams. It's um, preparing the students to review. It's throughout the exams, keeping them motivated. It's after the exams, grading if they have to grade. It's, it's, it, and I like how you mentioned a sense of duty. It's something that I think Stoicism doesn't explicitly talk about a lot. They don't mention duty. Um, at least not explicitly, um, but I think it's very implicit in the ways in which they're at least, if not if not dutiful to um, uh, to if they don't mention duty in, in with respect to um, uh, anything practical, they at least have a sense of duty to their to their virtues and to their values. Um, but I but I also agree it's um it's a sense of duty to community. I think this is in relation to Stoic cosmopolitanism. This idea that you should you you should serve your community because in the end it'll always serve yourself. Um, and I think it's the same idea that you have this sense of duty and that if you help your students or if you help your kids and children, um, you're gonna feel that um you're gonna feel a reward afterwards. Um, because, just because perhaps in my example, how much they succeed. In your example, how much, um, um, uh, um, what's the word? Um, perhaps uh, um, uh, enjoyment. Yeah, perhaps enjoyment they get out of it. Um, Uh, Philip, I didn't know if you raised your hand because you turned your mic off or you had a, you actually had something to say. Oh, sorry, my bad. No, um, I was uh, turning off my camera. It was just somebody at the door and I had to run for a second. Sorry about that. No, no worries. Um, I wonder if anybody else had anything they wanted to bring up. I think we went over a few things uh, um, and I, I don't want to keep the conversation going by me just talking. So, I mean, we had discussed a little bit about in the beginning how we can teach our kids a little bit of stoicism through very implicit ways, um, how we can discuss um, stoicism in relation to parenting to help us keep ourselves as anxious. I think duty is a really good one. Um, but going back to these more specific, like Fragen, um, uh, perhaps ex exercises, for example. Um, uh, I know that uh, Tony had uh, spoke about exercises. There's one exercise you mentioned uh, very specifically about um, every day or every other day, pretty regularly, though it sounds like you guys sit at the dinner table or the breakfast table and you basically go over a quote by one of the big three. Um, and you discuss it, discuss the applications to it, what it means. Um, I wonder if there's anything else anybody has thought of, any other kind of ritual or exercise. Um, 
that you guys would use with your kids every so often to help them understand um, Stoic principles, if not explicitly. I mean, I don't need to have like an academic discussion. I think that wouldn't be too useful to have an academic discussion about Stoics with your kids. But rituals or I like the, I like the, when Toby, you added rituals or meditations at the end um, or exercises, those are a bit more, sound more practical than any kind of academic discussion. Um, Shikham. First, I think uh, Toby raised uh, his hand uh, before me. Uh, but just oh, sorry, to, I didn't see it. Uh, I just wanted to ask what you think about a uh, guided journaling or um, ways to, to help uh, children uh, put their thoughts uh, on the paper. Um, you know, sometimes these are very private uh, thoughts. How can a parent really uh, participate in this um, process without, um, how to say, invading their kids' uh, personal space and uh, thoughts. I think just to follow up on that, and Phil and, and Toby, we're going to come back to you. Sorry, I didn't I didn't see your hand raised, but um, maybe we discuss we just respond to Shakam's uh, question first, and um, and maybe maybe somebody else has a different perspective. Um, but if hypothetically, if I had my own kids, I I think I would find it difficult to kind of impose that kind of regular ritual. I mean, I would introduce it to them, or maybe I'd show them a little bit of my journal that I keep and discuss just as an example, if they're going through a hard time, give them suggestive uh, ex exercises, suggested exercises or, or rituals that they can do every day, every day or, or every week, something regular that can keep them, um, keep them less anxious, uh, keep them understanding the world better and in things in context, like for example, not, not caring about others' opinions when, when the time is not right. Um, but I think to an extent, that's an example where that's the best you can do. I think as a parent, then you would have to say, okay, I introduced my, my kid to this daily ritual of, of journaling. They understand it, they kind of like it, maybe they'll experiment on their own. I'll give them a notebook to kind of encourage them. But in the end, I think if they don't do it, that's something that's out of your control. That's something you can't, I think forcing them to do something like that, that's, um, uh, uh, that's not the parent's job. As a teacher, it's very different, right? I mean, as a teacher, you kind of have to ask, provide an environment where they're kind of motivated or incentivized to do certain tasks for homework or for learning certain content during certain exercises. But as a parent, um, that's um, that this shouldn't be their role. I think if they're too overbearing, their, their kids will respond negatively. Um, if 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 the parent tries to impose such a strict ritual to them, I mean, writing is very um, uh, what's a word um, effort effortful. It's uh, it can be taxing on the mind, and for a kid that young, I mean, when they're older, perhaps, but when a kid that young, they're um, in, in middle school, maybe between the ages of six and ten, six and thirteen, um, they're going to do what they want to do. They're up and coming, they're being young and they're going into puberty. They're, if they're not gonna um, explore that kind of ritual. But it is interesting. I, I like the idea of kind of maybe giving your kid a, a journal and showing them what you think helps you. And, but then that's kind of where the buck stops in terms of giving them any, any task uh, ritual to do. Uh, Toby. Yes, hi. Um... Yeah, thinking about, um, I wanted to say, yeah, um, I, I have quite a strong background in Buddhism and I'm kind of fresh with the whole Stoicism uh, philosophy, but I think there's a lot of parallels. And, and um, for me, I think um, what, what I find uh, very central for me is like the um, concept of mindfulness. So also like, know your own emotions and feelings and, and going on inside. I think that is what I would like to also give to my kids in some way. I also, I, I didn't find any way yet to, to make rituals. I, I was thinking maybe something like 
just like a small like gratitude thing before dinner or like something small or like a few mindful breaths uh, before going to bed or something like that because and now thinking about it i think i don't know if that i, I don't know how mindfulness is, is maybe also part of stoicism i, I don't know um yet but um i think it could be thinking about it it could be like also a form of um maybe um kind of justice if you like know your own feelings maybe then you can also understand the feelings of the others and your friends and and that could hopefully lead to a more harmonious uh, interactions or um something like that um, i don't know yeah, yeah Chetan. um Related to this, I was thinking that what really, like, what I could understand from my little understanding of Stoic philosophy was that you can only, uh, you can only differentiate between what you can control and what you cannot control. So I think what you can control maybe in the family is that on a dinner table or whenever you guys get together, you guys, you try to share a story. And I think story is a great way to inspire any younger mind or something that, that happened with you today and you were able to pull off a stoic philosophy in your life. And, and then maybe, just maybe, that inspires a kid. Maybe, maybe not, but uh, always sharing a story and a personal experience would really touch the younger one nicely. Uh, yeah, Tony. Uh, that's a great point, actually. Um, so that we do that uh, of an evening, and me and my son Charlie have come up with this character called Rimpo the Dragon. He's the only stoic dragon to ever exist in the whole of humanity. Um, so, and he um, directs and helps Marcus Aurelius's army, but usually it's it's actually directed by my son. Um, he's the central character in my son. So storytelling is absolutely great and it gives an element of control as well to the, to the child. They can control what goes on in the story, but the underlying principles are always stoic. So they're presented with situations as to what they would do, some quandaries. Should we do this? Should we do that? And it's an opportunity for him then, my boy, to make a decision which will be influenced by stoic principles. So storytelling, I agree, absolutely fantastic way to, to really spark the imagination. Yeah. It's a really good couple of ideas I've heard. The um, the gratitude one, Toby, Toby mentioned the um, <clears throat> of um, it, it um, and I, I don't want to make it seem like it's um, it's replacing prayer at the at the dinner table, right? Being being gracious, being or being um, thankful for something, but it is. Um, uh, um, it is common in, in human experience anyway to just be involved in a kind of daily spiritual or semi or pseudo spiritual ritual um, to kind of keep yourself on on good footing and less anxious generally. Um, and I really like gratitude. Um, uh, the um, it's something also brought up before. I think mindfulness depends on the context. Mindfulness can be anything and mean anything. And the Stoicism definitely has a lot of mindfulness in in um, in its own way. I think a little different than Buddhism or at least differently interpreted or, interpreted or, um, or stated. It, it's phrased differently, but it is very similar. Um, if not through meditation, I think meditation, for example, in, in the way in which Buddhists um, meditate specifically to just recognize the body um is very different than i think stoicism is much more thoughtful it's um in the sense that it's it's focusing more on thoughts rather than body um rather than on physical things it's focusing on mental things it's focusing on how you reason um there's actually um i wanted to mention <clears throat> meredith kuntz um this uh the the author of the stoic blog the stoic mom she likes to say to her kids, um, stop, drop, and question your impressions. Um, it's a kind of play on, I don't, I'm not sure how, how ubiquitous this is used around the world, but in the US, um, 
stop, drop, and roll is a famous expression when there's a fire. You stop, you drop, and then you roll. If you're on fire or if fire's around you to kind of get, get extinguish the fire. And she kind of uses that plan words to get her kids' attention. She says, stop, stop, drop, and question your impressions, which is qu quite creative and, and quite ingenious to use that because it, kids, kids know when they hear stop, drop, that, you know, that they, they, they're already um, inclined to react to that. And then question your impressions is a really nice way of using sto stoic principle. It's kind of an irregular in ritual, I would frame it as. It's, some, it's not a ritual that's that you use daily or every day or every time uh, at the same time, but use it whenever um, perhaps your kid or yourself are reacting to something that's a, that's a first impression and that you need them to kind of stop and think about this for a second. And then I, I really liked your, I really liked this, the, the storytelling idea. Um, uh, I, I'm thinking of all these books that are sold to, for kids, the, um, uh, the choose your adventure or, 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 um, or video games that help make you basically choose what to do next or, or thereafter. Um, and these kinds of ways of storytelling, I think also I'm thinking not just, um, helps you understand, um, helps them understand, um, uh, action and wise decision making, but also helps them understand the consequences. Um, helps them be a bit more mindful of their mindful of their actions and the kind of consequences that can have on the environment or other people. Um, it's a really really good couple of exercises you guys mentioned. I feel like storytelling is also something that's something that kids are much more receptive to. Um, just kids are used to it anyway, whether before bed or, or just generally, they're used to that. Um, I'm also thinking just as, a, as another tactic, um, uh, I mean, there's a, there's, a huge, there's a huge emphasis on the fact that um, you can't control your kids. Ultimately, you can't. Um, but there was something that I actually didn't, I didn't necessarily like in one of Meredith Kuntz's um, articles. Uh, she, she mentioned you also can't ultimately um, control, um, uh, control your your kids' um, health, their personality. Um, to an extent, I think I think there are ways in which you can at least influence your environment and influence the home environment also. Um, so ap apart from rituals, I think there are ways in which, for example, are you filling your home with um, um, video games and um, candy? So are you making it um, much more addictive or unhealthy? Or, or are you filling your home with, um, uh, I mean, there are certain, there's there's a certain extent where you can fill your home with that and it's, it's a moderate level, but are you filling your home with um, uh, more educative toys or more interactive games between like Tony, Tony was saying, between playing tag with the sun, are you um, giving them an opportunity to eat healthy foods more often or read books? Do you have bookshelves? So I think there's also indirect ways you can influence your environment that can help your kids understand what's, what's healthy or not. I don't know him, to Toby, the one, yeah, the, um, San Francis de Sales. Um, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, it uh, just came to mind. My, I think I heard it somewhere before. I, I think no, I, I think that was what I wanted to say before that when you were on the how um, what what could be helpful for the parents, and then I I, I find yes that that I if I try to be try to stay patient as much as possible. That, that is quite a helpful thing for me to stay a bit calm. And I think it also um, helps my kids also when, when they tell a story and, and it kind of from, from the day and it's kind of drags. And, and But if, if I stay patient and present and, and still listen with attention, then I think that's very valuable also for the kids. And um, yeah, I think that, that I wanted to say that before. Yeah, it's a really good idea. The um, that the storytelling doesn't even have to be all in one. Um, uh, it's it's you can frame it like a television series. <laughs> you can break up the story over over days and just a few days, and um, so they're kind of um, eager to get to the end, but patient enough to wait every day for the next part of the story. That's a really good point. Um, um, 
It's also really good that you mentioned patience. I mean, there are other virtues, or let's say I would call them sub-virtues, right? Virtues kind of underneath the big four um, that you can use. Like patience is a really good one you mentioned. Um, that could really help. And I think I think that also helps kids. Um, I think there's also, a, um, I think to build on this discussion, there's also an element of um, contemplating the sage or being the sage. Um, I think your kids look up to you to a large extent. And because they're looking for role models, they're looking for somebody to set an example. And I think so long as you guys and you, you guys sound like you're doing a great job at or um, uh, I know for a parent, maybe from a first person perspective, a parent's always or especially also because as a teacher, I'm always like I'm always questioning myself. God, that was a terrible lesson I did. Or as a parent, you're probably always questioning yourself. Wow. What did I just do? Or was this was this not a good thing that I should have done as a parent? But I think from I think um, it's one, it's good we're questioning ourselves all the time, and and two, um, uh, I think it just sounds like you guys are really putting in the effort to be good parents, and I think um, that means you're also putting the effort to be good role models as well, good sages, basically good role model sages for your for your kids um, to set an example for, uh, Giannis. Um, it's more of a question, actually. Uh, I think we covered most of the things I had already in mind, but um, when I was reading earlier on this topic <clears throat> online, um, I found somewhere, I don't remember exactly where, uh, some argument about the topic of praising effort and praising the child. It, it, itself so it's it's a big i think a big topic in parenting um not to praise like uh try to say to a child yeah you're you're the best you're very smart uh, all these things but rather focus on praising effort and i saw somewhere um I saw somewhere some uh, someone trying to connect it with uh, some quotes from from uh, Stoics, but it was really not convincing at all to me. So I wanted to return this as a question here: What, what, how do you make this connection? Or if there are any any thoughts on this? Maybe I'll take a I'll take a step back if anybody else has anything to say. But that's a good point. Um, there's a big a big growing trend. At least when I was a kid, there's also that trend. Um, just uh, exactly. just uh, 15 years ago, that you know, there, there's this um, uh, when you go to uh, a sports event for kids, um, they over the course of time have been um, establishing a tradition like they would they would still give trophies or awards to kids who kids who lose or or or, or kids who are um in a competition that haven't been um that didn't end up uh winning let's say first place for example um to kind of show um to kind of promote uh the praising of effort um in a competition or in, in an activity but it is a good point that you shouldn't go so far as to uh, tell them that um, they did a perfect job. It doesn't matter if they didn't win. You know, there's there's an extent where you have to frame it not as not as um, uh, um, how well you did, but that you 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 put in the effort, and that um, that's also difficult. I'll take a step back now because I'm also not sure exactly how to frame it. There's an extent to which I think they're right. You should praise effort to an extent because. Um, Stoics generally like that. They like that you you put in effort and that you you try your best, even if you're going to, even if you end up failing. But I'm not mm. sure how how else you would, you would frame that um, to not perhaps go to go too far by praising and them thinking that there's no mm. more improvement to do. You know, that's what I'm afraid of mm. is that they don't they they see that there's no room for improvement because they 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 did their best. Um, Maybe somebody else can speak more authority on this. <laughs> uh, if anybody's sp spoken to a kid on this, um, yeah. Yeah, Chetan. Um, so I will give this uh, an answer 
um, backing up from the sport that every Indian loves watching, and that's cricket. And uh, over the years of watching this game, I have seen some players, which I see them as one of the idols, as they they really work hard and they have completely transformed themselves. So one habit which which these players do that even if they win or they lose, they go back and they see what was good and what was bad. So even in the win, they had did something wrong. Like, like there are a few things that they did wrong in the match, dropped a catch or bowled in the wrong areas or didn't bat correctly. They would look at that. And especially in the losses, they would also <coughs> look at that. So yeah, being equal in both situations, win or lose, they go back and look at their problems and try to do them perfect next time is what I would come for. That's a that's a really, really good point. And just before I just before I turn to Philip and, and then Toby, there it's also common to do that in um in education too, that, that teachers are trained that when a student fails or a student um fall short of let's say perfection on an assignment or, or a test. Um, the idea is to kind of uh, not uh, not tell them good job, better luck next time. The the idea is to kind of okay, well let's review what you did and then ask them. Ask them, well, how do you think you could have done this differently? How do you could how do you think you could have done this better? And then let them continue and review what they're doing. And I think that's like giving themselves feedback can really help. Um, reframe it from a point of you're failing or you can do better to how can I do this differently is um, a much better, much better reframing. Um, uh, Philip. Thank you. Um, I, um, I just want to um, say something about um, what you said, Janis, when you opened your um, statement that you found it difficult to relate um, like the, 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 the praising of effort to um, Stoic principles, and maybe the the connection that I could find is um, that um, you know the effort is the only thing that you can control. So if you go in and you um, don't give it your best effort, then you know like you're you're um, not setting yourself up for the best possible outcome. And the outcome is um, kind of optional, um, right? Because it's outside of your control and um, actually, this morning I um, I have to open up my notebook because just this morning I came upon a quote that fit maybe in some way. Um, it says, "You're entitled to the work, not to the fruit of the work," and it's just another way of expressing the same idea again. Um, I am without children. Um, I used to lead a youth group many many years ago before I was in uh, into philosophy. So I'm woefully. Uh, unqualified to say anything about the merits of this as a parenting measure, <laughs> so I'm I'm going to uh, refrain from saying anything about it. But um, yeah, I I just um, maybe this helps you to um, put this into context, or maybe this is yeah exactly a talking point exactly. to somebody else. It goes back to control. I completely agree, and we are. I think it makes me also realize how much wired we are to the. To the to the achievement and to to I mean all our lives we we are praised for the achievement and not for effort yeah so I think I think it's common to most people so when you try to teach to your child the opposite it's really hard so I think it is uh, it's one of the most common mistake I make I have to say because it is. It comes natural to 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 praise the result, to praise the uh, the achievement itself. So, yeah, it is about one of the core principles of Stoicism to uh, um, uh, say, yeah, I did my best, and what is the result? I cannot control. If I did my best, it is everything I could do. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Toby. Yes, I, I also like that, that sentiment, yeah, because um, I think um, I also 
have some friends who had very strict parents and they were very focused on the external educational outcomes and then the children get got really stressed out and actually ultimately were very high achievers but not really happy people and I'm, I'm a bit anxious about that and also with my I have a six-year-old daughter and a one-year-old son and I have also a bit the the opposite problem that um, my six-year-old daughter, she, she loves to draw and, and make paintings, but she's a bit of a perfectionist and then really stresses her out when when there's like a small details, like not exactly how she wanted, then she gets, sometimes she gets really upset and sad. And and for me, it's, it's sometimes heartbreaking because it's such a beautiful picture, but then like something is not exactly as she wanted. And, and I don't know, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I, I, I try to find ways that, that she also kind of relaxes in that way and maybe sees the process as, as fun and, and, and not like doesn't, yeah, uh, doesn't get stuck in this perfectionism. I don't know. It's a bit like an yeah. Problem. Yeah, the perfectionism, I think, has to do with the perception that we are not allowed to make mistakes. Um, um, uh, doing a mistake is uh, frustrating for for children because again it connects with the with the result. The result has to be perfect, not uh, you know. So I think I think more or less is the same situation, but from a little bit different angle. I wonder where she got that from because I mean we 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 still love her paintings anyway, but I don't know if it's from <laughs> if there's a lot of competition at Kita. I don't know, but maybe yeah. <laughs> but do you do you um, personally? So we have this um, streak in yourself that um, like I I notice for myself I'm a perfectionist as well, right? So um, again, I have no children. I I'm completely un prepared but like i i can totally see how something like like how i approach something would would influence even like subconsciously even when you don't know about something the way that you talk about the work that you do um uh or the way that you present something that you did um if you have this perfectionist streak yourself um do you think this might be um related or not I, like I'm, I'm not trying to you know it's like assume anything i'm just uh, you know Good question. Um, I, I think, I mean, obviously we, she, she is also like a mixture of me and my wife and um, yeah, maybe, maybe there are some subconscious um, straits that, that she inherited. Yeah, it could be, uh, but um, I'm, I'm not, I'm actually not very artistic, so I don't know, but my wife, so yeah, I don't know, maybe, yeah, could, could be, yeah. But, but I, yeah, I, I try to, like a teacher that that is still beautiful and that we all make mistakes and that it's okay and and we can always try again and, and, and things like that. So yeah, I think I also wanted to say um I um, also discovered recently um, Mr. Rogers and I'm like very inspired by him also and and I think yeah what what, what I also like about him is that that he tries to um, yeah teach that that uh, that yeah the children. That, that there's like an inner like an inner goodness or like an inner core and and that um, most of other things are just like outside things like how we look and, and what we achieve but but then like that, that the children also I don't know rely on on their the the inner goodness and and the core I, I don't know I, I can't really explain it well but I, but I really like this this sentiment that that we yeah, that we have a kind of a grounding in ourselves and then, um, yeah, and then we can also deal better with, with um, external things and competitions and, and, and work and guitar and everything. Mm. It's a, um, uh, there was a really, really good discussion. There's a really good back and forth you guys had. Um, it makes it makes me think, um, and and you guys are absolutely uh, right in the sense that um, we have to um, teaching your kids the 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 value of mistakes are okay, um, and that I think what we can draw from that is that um, I think people have this idea that achievement is linear, 
that you often just keep getting better and better and better, or that you keep getting towards perfection in this linear fashion. And I think also also framing, um, and I don't, again, like Philip, um, I in, like in theory, this works, but in practice, talking to your kids may not work. But framing, not necessarily all the time, but framing achievement in a way that's sometimes, it's rocky. You can make mistakes, but over the overall picture is where you want to be but it's okay if you make mistakes in the in in or have bumps and cracks along the way towards achievement that's fine and kind of framing it like that that mistakes are okay it, it's and the the long-term effort the long-term being uh, sustaining that effort is the value is that's the virtue is sustaining that effort a little over a long period of time um yeah um should I come Just to continue the, the line about how hey, your kids are not under your control, hey, Marcus Aurelius' son Commodus was one of the worst emperors, uh, shoulder to shoulder with Neron and, and the such. And so how come um, uh, Marcus Aurelius' uh, son was so uh, megalomanic, so unstoic <laughs> in so many ways, because yeah, I'll say I don't think Marcus Aurelius says to blame, because what can could he have done? I am I'm sure he led uh, by example and was the most uh, compassionate. Um, and patient uh, and just that uh, he could be. Um, but still, because of uh, other influences, because uh, his own um, um, as a, a character, his son was completely different. And so, I don't know, if uh, parenting has so much so little influence. Yeah. Does it matter what what you do as a parent? I was also wondering what kind of pa of of parent Marcus Aurelius what was <laughs> because his son yeah. his son was uh, quite a challenge as I have understood. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Marcus uh, was fighting. Uh, the tribes uh, near the Danube for uh, mm. most of uh, his son's uh, like childhood and teenage years. So I don't know how how much time he actually spent with him, which is yeah. And his duty as an emperor came before his duties as as father. Uh, that's yeah. That's another question. War called parenthood. Yeah, yeah, that's um, he, uh, and because the job, because the nature of the job, he he chose emperor. I mean, if you had to choose between being there for your kid for for a few months or um, protecting the realm, protecting the empire in on the frontier, then you're you're probably going to have to choose protecting the the empire and go to war. Um, that's a good point too. He was. Uh, as much as we like to think he was a good parent, and maybe for the times he was there for Commodus, he was a good parent, but he just wasn't a parent, not because he was a bad parent, but because perhaps a lot of the time he wasn't there, he wasn't present. And I think that um, what, that's outside of his control. Parenting literally was outside of his control for a lot of it. And what's what's nice is that for us and for you, for you, for, for the three of you here, especially that you, it's in within your power, it's in your control, that you are there and present for your, for your kids. Um, and I think that's, that's entirely within your control, you know, whatever decisions you make, and sometimes you have to make different decisions to be there or not be there, but that's within your control. That's like to be there for your kid is within your control. Um, and I think Marcus Aurelius would agree. You know, he's, you know, he knew, he knew consciously he wasn't going to be there, but he had to, he had to make that conscious decision. Um, I don't know if that was a fateful decision. <laughs> the fact that, you know, the next emperor was one of the worst and it wasn't too long afterwards, at least in the grand scheme of history, that the Roman Empire would fall. But um, it was a decision he made anyway. Um, 
I think um, there was also a story I read in, um, so uh, you guys had seen the uh, advertisement I shared over Telegram for um, uh, the new book being released in Germany by Kai Whiting. Uh, this, it was an introduction to Stoicism, but so af after reading it uh, and just, uh, I, I won't give a book review right now, but um, he cuts up every chapter into two parts. The first half is usually an introduction to a Stoic principle and the second half is a focus on like a particular person's story. And usually that person is from modern history. So like he'll talk about a recent venture capitalist or entrepreneur. He'll talk about a civil rights activist and how they um, um, uh, um, embodied a certain story of virtue or, or principle. So I would encourage you to read it. It, it is, it is an only an introduction to Stoicism, but the, the, the kind of the examples he gives of living Stoicism are really useful. And, and the one I wanted to point out was that he had a, one of the chapters he was talking about the civil rights activists in the US um, and how, um, I, if you're not familiar with her, um, there's a famous civil rights activist back in the 60s called Rosa Parks. And she, um, the, the whole, the reason why she's famous is because uh, it was illegal in her city to, um, uh, for, af at the time, for African Americans to um, uh, sit where white people wanted to sit. So if a, a, if a white person asked uh, a black person to please get up, I need, I need a seat, they have to get up by law. That was the way it was back then. And um, she refused. Um, and um, so in this context of achievement, the, this, this, the story Kai Whiting wanted to paint was that she was not the first one to do that. She was only the first one to make waves throughout the media and throughout the courts and for change to really happen. But there were actually two or three others before her to do the same kind of act and nothing, nothing came out of it. There was no good consequence in, this, in the scheme of civil rights. And the, the point he was trying to make is this idea of achievement, this idea of um, uh, that um, he, he framed it in terms of um, accuracy and precision, um, how they were um, uh, they they were precise in the in the way in which they 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 targeted good consequences and they they targeted good um, embodying and, and showing good value and good principle and good virtue. Um, but they could not be sure, they could not control the outcome or the effects. And he also framed it in the sense of this, this up and down motion, but somewhat long-term achievement. Um, and that story stuck with me. So I, I think all, all these ideas are, are perfect um, because they definitely embody this idea of the end goal is not within your control, but you can at least try and make a few waves in the middle mm -hmm that could maybe lead up to achievement in the end. Um, I think your, I think kids are also never gonna react perfectly. I think there's always gonna be sometimes we try and teach our kids stoic values, stoic principles, and there's always gonna be that one or two times when they, when they just don't want it, they don't wanna hear it. I think there's also a, a temporal a, a, a dimension to this where there are some times where you wanna teach them but you know it's probably best to stay silent and just let them get whatever they need out of themselves. Maybe they need to vent, maybe they need to just talk it through because you know they need that time. And perhaps it's good, it's wise you let them do that because it's wise perhaps not to talk to them while they're in this heat and this, this, this emotional rage. Maybe sometimes you just need to let that pass and then you can discuss with them afterwards. Uh, sorry, Yanis. Yeah, actually, actually, now you're going to the direction where I also wanted to to go um, because I think we passed it before a little bit too fast, and I think it's important. Maybe, maybe I raise it again. Um, I think it was Tetan who said about the mi mindfulness of, of the emotions. Uh, uh, but anyway, I think I think one of the biggest challenges raising a child, because again, my daughter is five. So the biggest challenge at this age is to understand emotions and to control emotions, well, it, which is not possible at this age, but slowly um, they learn, or, or as a parent, we, the parents have to teach the children to understand their emotions and control them, which is, I think, a very typical case where 
even grown-ups still have not learn how to understand their emotions and control them and 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 stoicism is a lot about um tagging your emotions not being uh, and and you know being uh, out of them and be able to 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 function without letting your emotions overwhelm you so so again i think stoicism has something to offer here i cannot uh, uh, believe that it's not related because, uh, you know, again, understanding what is the emotion we are feeling, that we are feeling an emotion right now, what is this emotion we are feeling, and how we can put it under control so that it does not overtake us, I think it's, it's first for the grown-ups a big challenge because I don't know many grown-ups who have, can do it so, so well. Um, and then it's teach our children um, how to do it. And the best I can do for now is to help my child tag the emotion, understand what is the emotion they're feeling. So it's the first phase, you know, um, anyway. <clears throat> when, when she's three or four or five, this is where that is the time to start understanding the different kind of emotions. And, and mindfulness, again, it's not a bad word. Uh, because I think it's more of uh, observing your emotion, understanding, um, and be aware of it. Yeah, it's the first step before you can control it. So again, I think I think it's a quite a good overlap here between stoicism and par and, and parenting. You make a good point too, that it's not just kids who have this problem. It's uh, it's adults too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it, we all, we've all probably caught ourselves in the, in the heat of some passion as well. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's, um, it's also probably different the way in which we would teach our kids how to handle emotions. We had a whole discussion. And now I can't remember whether it was two or three months ago, but it was, about, it was around then we had a discussion, a, a series of two discussions where we discussed the passions and discussed how to handle emotions. Um, and um, it's probably, it's well, for one thing, it's probably, you could, like Tony had said, for his son of, of 20 years, you can, you can probably teach to a, a somebody who is that age or older the difference between um, uh, um, indifferent emotions and passion, these, these toxic passions um, that Stoics like to frame. Um, but for a kid, it's probably not so, it's pro again, that's probably like a very technical abstract way of framing emotions that you wouldn't want to do. Um, uh, so yeah, for, for kids, um, I think again, just to echo, you're absolutely right. Just um, when they're young, they need to go through these phases to really under start to understand themselves. Um, I think that's there's there's also an ethical component to it too, um, not just from the point of view of how to teach your kids, but how to let your kids be kids and be themselves and be independent. Like part of part of being part of letting them know that it's okay to kind of go through this stage in life is sometimes when they're especially very young, like like you were saying, five or six years old. Um, from the case of two of two of your kids, um, that. Um, it's uh, it's probably best that they go through some of these some of these phases um, by themselves to be by their side though to kind of talk them through what happened afterwards but still let them go through some of those emotional outrages because in the long run it's going to teach them actually to understand their emotions better. Um, it kind of I think it paints a different view of stoicism too that it's not exactly universal. It's kind of it's kind of something you have to mature into to become to become stoic to become to become stoically minded. Yeah, Tony. It's an interesting point that you, you talk about the ethics um, behind stoicism and everything else. I had a conversation with my wife the other day about whether it's right or wrong to um, oppose but to sort of encourage stoicism, um, our boy to be involved in stoicism. Um, and it sort of turned around to the point where I was, when I was a child, Catholicism was thrust upon me. I had no choice in front of an Irish family, really. Um, I was never a Catholic. 
um, anyway at heart. But um, is it right from an ethical perspective that we lead our children in particular directions, in beliefs, principles, religions, whatever it is, belief, um, belief systems? Or should we just leave them enough room to see what the example of their parents is and make their own choices? Yeah, Toby. I think um, it's a matter of, yeah, the, maybe showing the values um, like um, in the way we conduct ourselves in the life and in the family. I think, I think that that can teach them a lot. I think because um, I'm pretty much Buddhist and my wife is Christian and it still kind of works um, because there's also a lot of overlapping values of, um, yeah. And, and I think, I think that's, that, that should be the way like kind of leading by example and um, having a strong connection and talking a lot. I think that, that can, then we can communicate the values and give them also. Um, yeah. I think it's maybe helpful to, um, and I think Toby is going in the right direction, that it's it's perhaps impossible not to impose certain values on your kids. I think that's outside of our control, whether or not, whether or not we, we're, we're imposing it on our kids, teaching it to our kids, or kind of like you said, Tony, leaving, leaving stoicism in the room, you know, the parent practices it or kind of leaves examples of it in the room, but doesn't necessarily teach their kids directly about it. It's kind of impossible to leave an environment empty of, of, of value or some sort of value system. Um, to be honest, I don't know the right answer. And I don't know if, if, if any of us does. What, what I can say is that for me, like if, if, if I married somebody who is religious and, and I'm not, but if I married somebody who was religious, um, I, I would, I would make a distinction between, um, perhaps something metaphysical and something psychological. Like for example, if they're Christian or they're Catholic, imposing a belief on God is maybe something to hold off on, but, and that's something you can leave in the room. That's something my hypothetical wife could believe in, could speak about, but not necessarily teach their kid. However, components of Christianity, I may not mind her teaching. For example, um, uh, the I mean, the parallels between Christianity or Stoicism are, 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 are really interesting. And I think one good example is um, that does take an element from Stoicism is, um, I forget the exact phrase from, from the Bible, but it's um, do unto others as you would like to be treated, you know, treat others as you would like to be treated. Um, this is a very common Christian um, principle and also I think a stoic one as well um, to, to treat others, to do service to others as you would like to be treated as well. To an extent, it's not explicit in stoicism, but I think, I think it is at heart a stoic principle. But for example, if she wanted to teach that to, to our kid, um, I, I wouldn't mind. So I, I think I would, and I'm, again, there might be counter examples to this, but I would place a distinction between kind of metaphysical values, like a belief in God and psychological or social values, like treat others as you would like to be treated. I'm not sure if that helps, but, um, and I, I'm not gonna get into maybe, maybe the differences between different values or social values, but that's at least a start for me, how I would frame it. Yeah, in in this direction, I, I don't remember there was a quote shared on metaphysical in in this group itself that it that didn't matter what was metaphysical and how it works. What well, one should focus on what is in front of him or her, something like that. That quote on metaphysical was shared. I'm not very good with quotes that were shared there, so. That that reminded me of of this. So in general, I, I would say that like teaching any any philosophy or maybe any kind of values to the younger ones, 
I think uh, there was there was this idea that some time ago I studied in ethics in international business, and um, before doing anything, there was a writer who said, "Ask yourself if everybody were to do it, what would happen?" Um, so in general, I would say that if a child is learning some stoic values, it, if everybody did that, then the world would be a little bit better place, I would say. Not a very good, but maybe a little bit good citizens who are non-reactive and respectful for each other. It's a really good question to ask. I think that also hits back like that, that idea of um, that question of what would happen if everybody did this or everybody believed this or followed this. That goes back to um, uh, when I was doing some reading on Zeno uh, the founder of Stoicism, Zeno's uh, Republic that he wrote, which is now lost, but the, the fragments that we have of it that are that are recorded by other authors, um, apparently he envisioned like a, a future state of the world where everybody follows Stoicism. Um, he kind of envisioned this utopia in the Republic. Um, and um, <laughs> it just makes me think of that where um, uh, he, he kind of envisioned this peaceful, perfect world where everybody practiced stoicism and everybody treated each other stoically. Um, yeah, it's a really good question to think, think about though. I mean, what if everybody believed or thought, thought the same thing um, and how would that make the world? Um, yeah, I think generally it's difficult. Oh, um, I think it's generally it's, it's, it's um, because it is a is it is it is an ethical quandary. Should you still impose these values on your kids? Because, for example, and before before I get to you, Tony, um, for example, what if there's? Uh, I think an, another question to ask is, um, which I think maybe further um, puts a quandary on the issue is, um, what if we have? What if there's a psychological study on stoicism that shows that a certain principle or, or exercise or meditation ritual of stoicism doesn't work as effectively as something else. Um, and I think, I think there's also an element of just act on what you know. This is also a stoic principle. Like you can't really act beyond the boundaries of your own knowledge. So if, if you think, if you know, and you, you've done the research, you've literally done the academic research, you've read a lot of um, academic input on this or um, literature on this, then and you, you believe this might be, if not the best, but a very rational, robust approach, then, then that's the best you can act on. Um, Tony. Yeah, I'm interested to know what you think about the notion of punishment for the children as well, because it's something we haven't discussed today. Um, Could you repeat that? Your, your mic kind of went, went in and out. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it was just uh, your volume dropped while you were saying something. All right, okay. I'm, I'm interested to to know what, sorry, to, to get your views on the notion of punishment for children, because we take the view that we don't praise and we don't punish. And I'm terrible for praising. I'm like, you're the best, go ahead. And my wife said, you shouldn't praise him. But we don't punish either. We don't. I don't shout at him. We don't send him to his room. We don't have a, a, a naughty stir or anything of that nature. We just use conversation, we just use logic, we just use reason. And it's always worked perfectly well. Now, we've caught some slack for that off my family <laughs> over the years who think we're just too, you know, hippie-ish in our approach. But what do you guys think um, about punishment? Um, is it a useful way? of teaching our children right and wrong, or is it just outdated and outmoded nowadays? So, so just before just before I pick on pick on Giannis, I just wanted to comment how interesting it is that the traditional Stoics are kind of empty on words about parenting. Maybe Marcus Aurelius had a little bit to say. Maybe they had a quote here and there. But in terms of in terms of their in terms of what they say about stoicism, and I think I see Shikam maybe searching searching the web for something about this. But um, uh, and he can correct me if I'm wrong. But perhaps the extent to which they talk about parenting is 
it's out of your control. Do the best you can, it's out of your control. And I think it's good that we have this discussion because I think parenting is one of those uniquely modern stoic uh, um, themes that we really expanded upon. Um, Yanis. Yeah, I'm not sure I agree, actually. I uh, I mean, it is what you say, of course, it's true, but I think it's, I think there are more. Um, but, but first, Okay, about punishment, I think it's pretty established now, as I understand it, that punishment as belonging to a more general authoritarian parenting style is not working. This, I think, is pretty established and there's not. Um, and, and it's substituted with the uh, more, uh, apparent, I mean, a more effective way of parenting, which says, trying to show some empathy and I, and and that's why it is uh i think we're missing here to mo give more emphasis um on on empathy on on but maybe also on understanding on compassion uh, uh feeling um um and i again i imagine marcus aurelius having the son that he had um trying to show understanding. So it's not just um, a, control, a matter of control, but it's also trying to show compassion and, and being not, not uh, strict, but being um, accepting and trying to understand, to show to your child that you understand um, why he is or he feels how the way he feels um, and 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 at the end so empathy yeah so all this i think connects somehow so that that's that's what i wanted to say yes i can yeah i couldn't find anything um and I think uh, they would agree with uh, with Yanis. Um, yeah, punishment uh, wouldn't help. They wouldn't learn not to do the thing. They would learn to not get caught, uh, which is not a good thing to learn. Uh, but what can you do if your kid uh, doesn't uh, act uh, with temperance and just devouring uh, the whole ball of candy? What do you do uh, when your kid is uh, pushing somebody in the playground? Not uh, uh, acting uh, uh, justly, maybe being uh, greedy with toys. And I don't think punishment is the answer to, to these problems. Uh, explaining why it's wrong would be um, yeah, way better for the growth than suppressing them and uh, exerting your own control and power over them. Um, and I think it can work also uh, with uh, like uh, bigger kids, like how do they call them? Adults. But yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm also, um, I think it's also, uh, interesting how we define punishment. Um, I think there is a measure of last resort. I wouldn't call it punishment. I think most of the time, I think especially if your kid is acting, if even if, even if acting out of control, it's always within reason to kind of discuss with them and maybe discuss with them alternative ways of acting or discussing the consequences. For example, if they ate that bowl of candy, um, then the, the, the punishment is there in and of itself. They're probably not going to feel good at eating that much candy. So the, they're already being punished for not feeling good. So what, what, why would you do anything else? And then discussing with them, do you think it was wise to eat that much candy? You know, some, you know, then you can kind of, that's a snowball effect. They, they think about it wasn't wise to eat that much candy and perhaps they're less likely to do it in the future. Um, uh, what else was, was I going to say? Um, and I think I think punishment 
may be a measure of last resort, but not in not in the ways I think we, we typically think of traditional punishment. For example, when I think of punishment, maybe something that's not really so much as punishment, but that is um, a restriction or um, a lack of reward. Um, for example, you wouldn't reward your son for punish, pushing another student, on the, uh, push, pushing another kid on the playground. Um, so that lack of reward is in, in and of itself, or the discussion that you have with them is in and of itself something of a punishment. Um, so just suggesting alternatives, I don't know if that's also possible. I mean, just like with the candy ball or pushing the kid in the playground, like suggesting alternatives, like what else could you have eaten that made you feel better? Or how could you have treated that kid and they would have responded better? Um, I'm just shouting ideas, <laughs> but it is an interesting point that um, uh, uh, that um, should should parents punish their kids at all. Um, but I think it depends on the extent to which you you make restrictions or you discuss with them and, and when you do that. Um, I'm just reading Giannis's quote he wrote by Marcus Aurelius. It's a really good one. Yeah, I'm Let trying to find, uh, yeah. exactly, I'm trying to say, I mean, what I was trying to describe and I'm falling so hard in words, but I think, I think, I think it's more or less something like this, like, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, so to the other person what is right, yeah, um, or where he's making mistake, but then that's it, um, try to be mild and accepting and not not punishing or not not uh, strict. Uh, sorry, I didn't see whose hand was raised first. Uh, was it Ch Chetan and then Toby? Okay, Chetan. Um, yeah, I, I agree with everyone that they say when they say that um, to reason with the child why they did wrong. Why is it wrong what they did? Um, rather than punishment, but uh, I would also like to add an aspect or, or a perception in this direction is that um, I, I believe I may be wrong is that every every human being, even sometimes animals, have a conscience of knowing if they did wrong something wrong. Like there is a tiny bit of conscience that that tells you that something was wrong, something was not done right. And, and this conscience is what sometimes comes in the way and, and tells us to stop something if something is not right. And maybe, maybe making the child aware of this conscience would, would make him next time be careful of pushing the other child. Because if you push the child, then their parents complain to your my parents, for example, I was a child who pushed the other child and their parents compared to me. And then there was embarrassment for my parents, for me. So then talk to him that, okay, how did it make you feel? I remember before even you were doing it and after you did it, how did it make you feel? So maybe being a catalyst to, to awaken that conscience in him that already exists would maybe help the child to uh, get better. But course not not punishing him uh, then Toby mm, I just want to ask uh, Tony and it was very interesting um, that you said you you don't punish but you also don't give praise like and well, what is the background for that or, or like um, what, what was the thought behind that um, I think it's called closed parenting, where you don't overly praise and you certainly don't punish. You allow um, reality to just take its course and use logic and reason. Um, as someone who was sort of overly punished as a child, I, I wasn't keen on the whole traditional punishment regime anyway. Um, I didn't do it with my 20-year-old and, and I haven't done it with my six-year-old. The praise thing is difficult for me because I like to praise my son. And I, as I said before, I constantly get told off about it from my wife. Um, she's far more sort of grounded when it comes to that type of thing. But I think the overly praising a child really 
sets false expectations maybe for the future and it isn't grounded in reality you know so instead of saying you're great at drawing that's an amazing drawing what you did which i would my wife would rather say that's an absolutely great effort what you've put in there i see what you explain this part to me that's really interesting and that's like the drawing that you did the other day as well and so she, she just has a much better approach than me i'm just like charlie you're the best which probably isn't the correct approach to take so i'm working on that at the moment but it certainly runs hand in hand with the lack of punishment because there's no extremes everything is sort of middle ground everything is as it should be it's dealt with logically and reasonably and it just really makes sense and it's so so effective yeah yes i can uh, just to say, uh, like uh, your wife uh, approached uh, Tony, just uh, raising awareness, uh, being very specific. This is this is, the, I think, one of the best ways to to build up uh, the confidence uh, in what they're doing, without the uh, overly high expectations. And yeah, general praise is good to feel for them uh, to feel good. But this very specific uh, with the comparisons and such will help them develop develop the really awareness about what they're doing and what uh, they can do better. Um, so yeah, good stir. Yeah, your wife's your wife's example is really good. Um, specific questions like Shakam mentioned, like those definitely help your kid think. I think that's also the end goal for most parenting. It's not just coming from the parent. It's helping the parent make the help the kid think for themselves, give themselves feedback. Think about what being um, cognizant or, or recognizing what they're doing in the act and what that means. Um, OK, so it's it's about the hour and a half mark. Um, so I did want to I did want to close out. Um, that does not mean you guys can't continue. Um, I'm going to leave. I'm, I'm going to try and be a bit strict on myself about leaving around the, the time that I, I set. Um, but again, if you guys want to continue or if you guys ever set up your own your own discussions and say, hey, you, you guys want to meet up and, and discuss this, then by all means, I'm, I'm open for anybody else more democratically organizing certain, certain discussions. Um, I did want to mention again the um, uh, the the presentation on Monday is for what I'm what I'm calling level one Stoics, people who know basically nothing about Stoicism or who know so little that they need or they want an introduction. Um, the PowerPoint presentation that I made is going to be 40 minutes. And then I, I reserve room about 20 minutes for like a QA. and a um, You guys don't have to attend, but I, I kind of encourage some 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 of you guys who know more about stoicism beyond that introductory level to attend just because i'm interested in feedback like what would you guys like when when you see the presentation hmm this was missing in it this should have been in it or this this was too much emphasized um so i'm open for you guys to come come by to the presentation on monday it starts at 6 30 because i wanted to make it so that anybody who is still at work um could still attend um after they leave work um so please attend if you want and if you can, because um, I'm also interested in hearing your feedback afterwards um, about what, uh, what what the presentation is, because it also helps me understand what you what you guys want somebody coming into a discussion like this to already know, to have in their heads, to have, to have as a stoic background. Um, and then my last question is just what, what do you guys want to talk about next Saturday? Um, I had so I already had two ideas in mind. They're a bit more non-practical and more it, it, discussions about um, the background of Stoicism. For example, I was interested in the um, intersection between cynicism and Stoicism, especially because Stoicism comes from cynicism to an extent. There was another topic I was thinking about that's a bit more practical, which is... Um, the Spartan influence on Stoicism. Uh, if anybody knows the history of Stoicism a little bit, a lot of the early Stoics were like, they really liked pulling examples of, of how to live from, Spart from Spartan rituals and, and daily exercises. Um, uh, and so I thought that would be, that would be interesting. 
Um, but if anybody else has um, anything else that they would be interested in studying and discussing, um, now's your time. What, what do you guys think? I'd really um, concur with you, Steve. I'm interested in cynicism. I have been quite a lot lately. I don't really know why. Just for the um, sensationalist aspect of it, I suppose. Um, but yeah, cynicism and how the whole Stoic movement began, but how it began through Zeno, you know, and um, how then it developed from there. I, I would really be interested in that. Um, I know you, sorry, Steve, um, I'll uh, say my piece uh, after you replied. No, I was just going to respond to him, but go ahead. Um, I, I was going to say, I know you had this um, probably not too long ago, um, but before I joined the group um, about Buddhism, um, maybe if there's renewed interest, um, some new faces, um, that would be fantastic. I'd be very interested in that. And also um, Taoism, um, I've been uh, reading up a lot about that. And I also found a lot of interesting parallels between Stoicism and Taoism. Um, I'd be very interested in that. OK, so this sounds like a good, um, it's interesting. We've been going through a really long stretch of practical discussions about Stoicism and applications in modern life. But maybe we can do another two or three discussions about other philosophies and Stoicism, which would be interesting. Yeah, and to be honest, um, Buddhism was a long time ago. Um, now that I think about it, we did a discussion on Buddhism perhaps in September or October last year. So, and we were founded in August. And just think, just thinking about that, we're just a few months away from being a year old. So, in reality, we're we're a lot not not old, but we're older than than I have always remembered ourselves being. Um, we can absolutely do another discussion of Buddhism, and Taoism is also interesting. Um, I think I know a little bit more Tao, about Taoism than than Buddhism. So, so doing a doing a bit on both would be good. Um, but um, I. There has been somebody else who said uh, who who mentioned cynicism. So how about um, what we could do is um, uh, we could do next Saturday's discussion on um, uh, cynicism and stoicism. Um, I do, however, want to um, start trying Thursday evenings as another uh, alternative to Saturdays for our discussions. Um, so what we could do is next Saturday we would focus on cynicism and sto stoicism. The following Thursday, I think that's the 27th, um, we could try out a, a, a 6.30 time that Thursday um, for this kind of discussion. And we could focus on um, Buddhism and Stoicism. Um, I know that nobody is going to be able to attend Saturdays and Thursdays. So we may not see some people on the Thursdays that we see on Saturdays. But again, it's also just to make room for those people who can't make Saturdays and they can make Thursdays more. Um, would so for anybody who's able to make a Thursday time, would six thirty be okay? Is that too early, too late to start? Okay, awesome. Okay, so um, those are the next two meetups coming up. I am also going to reschedule my workshop that I've created for uh, on virtue um, in uh, two weeks. Um, so I'll make an event for that as well. Um, and yeah, that's it. So uh, thanks, everybody, for, for joining. Um, I really like this discussion. This is really good. We should do another one on maybe parenting on stoicism months down the line. We can revisit it like we're, like we're going to be doing Buddhism and see where we are with that. Um, otherwise, um, that's, that's all I have for you. So um, I'll see everybody who's here on, on Monday, if not the next Saturday or Thursday. And have a good rest of your weekend, everybody. Have a nice weekend. Thank you so much, Steve, for organizing. Bye-bye.